Good morning. This is August 23rd, uh, 2020, and for the first time in five months, uh, First Presbyterian Church is uh, offering an on-site worship service uh, yet outside this morning, beginning at 8.15. Uh, we still are not worshiping in the building. We welcome you via the video to a shortened version of the longer service, the actual service outside but we still are in our broadcast and pre-recorded mode and we are grateful to God that you are part of this service today. As a part of the service, if you uh, desire to follow the singing with the full bulletin, then if you're working from a cell phone or tablet and you uh, look down to the lower right side of the screen, there is a gray chevron. If you click on that, uh, the bulletin will unfold uh, on your device. If you happen to be watching on a desktop computer, if you will scroll down below the screen, you will see the words, Show More. If you click there, the bulletin will unfold for you. And if you happen to be watching on a television, you may want to use another uh, electronic device. Go to the church website at www.fpcbryan.org and there on the main page you will see uh, a parenthetical uh, offering that says print uh, or a printable bulletin uh, is available with sermon here and if you click that then you will be to the bulletin for this service again this morning uh, we are worshiping god and we are most grateful to god that you are joining with us today. In Psalm 118 verse 24, we find these words. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Would you join us in singing the first three verses of Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Verses 14 through 16, and then 20 through 25. The Word of God. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I betray Jesus to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, Judas began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. When it was evening, 
Jesus took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples became greatly distressed, and they began to say to Jesus, one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He then answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes, it is written of him, but woe to that one to whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus replied, You have said so. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. In First Presbyterian Church's uh, faceted glass window, the covenant window number one, uh, we call it the creation window, the first two human beings gaze toward the extended, benevolent, and generous hand of God. And in their story, they will soon enough violate or betray the integrity which is at the heart of God's relationship with them. Yet for the moment, they gaze at God with awe. Yet in the eighth covenant window, one of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, has his back to Jesus in the room where Jesus hosts his close disciples at the Passover meal. The window's artistic portrayal shows Judas' face turned away from Jesus as Judas sits looking toward the congregation seated in the sanctuary. According to window number one, Adam and Eve will soon enough betray the integrity at the heart of God's relationship with them. According to window number eight, Judas Iscariot already has. Look how he holds in his lap or cradles in his hand the bag containing the blood money or the finder's fee for pointing out Jesus to the arresting officers. He'll do that in a matter of a few hours. It's as if in Matthew's telling of the story, all the other disciples at least faced Jesus as they peppered him with the question about who is Jesus' betrayer. Surely not I, Lord? Asked by 11 voices. And when Jesus declines to give a direct answer, uh, but only refers to the betrayer as, quote, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me, end quote, Judas, in the faceted glass window looking towards worshipers in the sanctuary, asks with the same word following the 11 and tosses the question over his left shoulder to Jesus who is at the center of the table. Surely not I, to which Jesus replies, you have said so. Judas knows something the other disciples have yet to learn. He is the four fee betrayer in the hours of that evening. The other 11 disciples have yet to realize they may not betray Jesus related to his arrest, which has yet to occur. In the story and in the faceted glass window, Judas does that. The eleven may not betray Jesus for fee paid by those who arrest him, but they are part of the world's betrayal. The integrity of God's covenant relationship with them is also broken, and they will not have to receive a fee of silver coins from the Roman authorities to realize that brokenness. Their recognition is understandably slower than, Jesus, than Judas 
understanding, holding the bag of coins cradled just above his lap. Bernard Slade's 1978 stage play, Tribute, was adapted into a movie in 1980. The lead character is a comedic actor named Scotty Templeton, and Scotty is dying of cancer. In many ways, he has used comedy and sarcasm as vehicles to distance himself through the years in vulnerable relationships with others. At a reunion roast in his honor, after he's received his diagnosis of stage four cancer, he explains this, telling his friends and family who have gathered about an aunt of his, uh, who was by any measure eccentric, I suspect. She sometimes said that she was a poached egg. She would lay a brown mat on the floor and she would say that it was her toast and so when she sat on her toast she expected folks not to step too close we all need some space we all need some private time some more some less but, but we all do need space and private time. Scotty was telling his friends and family that night how eccentric his aunt was, and yet she was clear about her thinking at times that she was like an egg on toast and don't step too close to me. Scotty was more subtle, and he tells that. He did not desire friends and family in his vulnerable space. But he did not tell them directly. He did not play it out with a brown mat like his aunt. He used conversation or comedy or silence or fussiness and irritability. Judas sits on the bench at the Passover supper with his fellow disciples and with Jesus as if he is sitting on Scotty's aunt's brown mat. Judas knows he has broken the integrity of his relationship with Jesus and God by selling out in order that the authorities can have a positive identification signal when they arrive to arrest Jesus. Yet what about the 11? The 11. Don't you and I tend to identify with them? I mean, really, how many of us identify with Judas? We haven't sold our willingness to identify Jesus at 10.30 p.m. in Gethsemane Park for 30 pieces of silver. We haven't done that. That was Judas doing and yet, it was only in the previous chapter of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, that Jesus is indicated as having told a parable about those who consider themselves as followers of Jesus and yet who decline to see Jesus in the lives of people who are living in poverty and with illness and in prison. And from that parable story, Jesus interprets that anyone who fails to see Jesus himself amid every person living in poverty, with illness, and in prison is a person who has broken integrity with God, having rationalized a way that Jesus could in fact be present in every person suffering life's struggles. Haven't we all failed God in Jesus? Haven't we all failed to see Jesus in the lives of those who desperately struggle? Haven't we all failed in this way? With no coins in our lap, still we have said with the eleven, surely not I, just as Judas said, 
with a hollow echo as he felt the weight of the bag of the 30 silver coins in his forearms and hands and over his lap. Surely not I. And it is Judas who stares blankly toward where we sit as the congregation in the sanctuary. He cannot look Jesus in the face, but from this window, Judas looks in our direction. We see that Judas' look is a blank stare, but doesn't the artist likely intend for you and for me, staring at guilty Judas, to consider and to sense our own breaking of integrity in the relationship of God among us now in Jesus. Have we always gotten it right in relation to Jesus' life and teachings, realizing that in Jesus, God is guiding us? Of course, we have not always gotten it right and been living as if Jesus is God's guide and embodiment of love among us. But Judas' blank stare, knowing of his particular guilt with the silver in his hands just above his lap for, for the identifying kiss that he will place on Jesus' cheek in two hours, Judas' blank stare is a knowing stare, knowing that the other 11 disciples also in the upper room and disciples down through the ages including you and me, that we all break integrity that God establishes in relationship to God's people. We all do. And how is that broken integrity redeemed? As God in Jesus shoulders the burden of love and walks the ascending trail as illustrated in the window bearing the cross tie of the instrument on which Jesus will be executed. Judas with us at the lowest level of the window, Jesus ascending the path toward the site of his execution, bearing the cross tie. What began in creation window, the number one window, with the blessing of integrity, is characterized as both betrayed and redeemed in the number eight picture window from the bottom going to the top. Realizing how Judas received silver for his betrayal of Jesus happening in two hours from that supper. We here at the base of the window realize, don't we, how we too are guilty of betraying the integrity of God's covenant with us which began in creation. We too are guilty of being clueless how Jesus is always among us in the suffering of God's people since Jesus says that's always a possibility and a reality. The sooner I realize that I may be guilty in a different way from Judas' guilt but that I am guilty with Judas and with the other 11 nonetheless, guilty of betraying the integrity that God establishes and desires, then the sooner I will be changed through the redeeming of love which Jesus shoulders for all the world. Look high in that window. Two ordinary crosses for two ordinary convicts, or for ordinary you and ordinary me. And in the middle where Jesus' cross has been a bright flash of red, there is the death of love, which is the sad step toward the integrity of love's redemption with cosmic and personal consequences for you and for me, and for all. Down low, Judas, staring in our direction, tells us almost all that we need to know, except for the scene on the hill at the top, whereupon the bright flash of red in the place of Jesus' cross 
where it was set indicates God's integrity broken by us at an incalculable cost. God's integrity broken by us is redeemed for all the human community. So let us take up our little brown mats. Not one of us, you know this friends, is a poached egg on a piece of toast. And when we recognize the extent of God being willing to redeem the integrity of love, we will be recognizing Jesus anew amid all the people of the world, both those who at the moment may be less vulnerable in life situations and those who are situationally most vulnerable, the so-called least of Jesus' sisters and brothers who are each our sisters and brothers also. God help us to go and live like Jesus was telling and living God's truth because we become convinced God loves the world exactly that much. All honor and praise be to God. Let us pray. O blessed creator, redeemer, and giver of new life, receive our thanksgiving for your gifts of blessing and holy care, for artistic expression, song, respect, generosity, and shared support. Grant us honesty to face ourselves Save us from self-deceit, manufactured excuses, and sad indifference. Chase from our lives cowardice and despair. Create within us convictions which perpetuate faith, hope, love, and equity in the light of justice for all. Heal pain and illness in every form and restore unto us your image for life together with all others of your people, this day and always. Once again, hear us praying from the words Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we leave this service of blessing, it will behoove us to remember that the special sacrifice unto God is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. But also may we remember that through many dangers, toils, and snares, each of us has already come. Tis grace has led us safe thus far, and grace shall lead us home. Amen.